Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's litigation webinar series. My name is Lauren Degnan, and today my colleagues John Dragseff and Mike Belanco will join me to present the Federal Circuit and Supreme Court yearly review. Our biographies, the presentation, and the New York, New Jersey blank CLE form are available for download on your control panel. Uh, please note that you must be logged in to the webinar on your device in order to receive CLE credit. Today's webinar will run for one hour and includes um, opportunities for questions and answers. Um, we will take them at the end, but we also encourage you to uh, launch the questions during the presentation and we will uh, uh, try to address them to the extent we can um, while we're on the topic. Um, we'll do our best to answer them, um, but if we run out of time, feel free to contact us personally after the webinar and we'd be happy to talk. Before we get started, I should remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fisher Richardson and is also not intended to address every court or case situation. So with that, uh, with that start, let's uh, jump to this presentation. Um, on slide two, we've got some, uh, some you know, uh, contact information. Slide three gives you the exciting outline of the topics we're going to cover. And we're going to lead it off with the TC Heartland Impact. And uh, Mike, would you get us started? Thanks, Lauren. So I um, wanted to start today's uh, discussion with uh, sort of the, the fallout from the TC Heartland Supreme Court decision from a few years back. Um, that, uh, you know, just a quick refresher, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone's well aware of that case. Um, but, you know, the, the big issue there was venue and where venue is proper in a patent case. Um, the Supreme Court came out and they said, you know, the patent specific venue statute is the one that governs VE holdings from the federal circuit saying that the patent venue statute had been, you know, abrogated by a, a, a change to the general venue statute. That case is, is no longer good law. So, you know, the, the holding from TC Heartland is that venue is proper in a patent case only where, where the corporation uh, is incorporated or where it has its regular and established place of business. And, you know, I think when that decision came down, a lot of folks wondered, okay, what does, you know, what's the test for a regular and established place of business? And in the past year, we've gotten some guidance from the federal circuit um, on that question. Uh, so the the Federal Circuit um, took up a case. It's uh, Cray is the, the name of the case. In Ray Cray. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and in that case, uh, so just just a little bit on the facts. So this is a case coming out of Eastern District uh, District of Texas. Excuse me. And uh, Cray was a company with um, facilities in you know Washington State, Minnesota. And it had some Texas facilities, but no, you know, true brick and mortar facilities in the Eastern District. Um, what was relied on for venue there was a, a traveling, you know, salesman for the Cray company, and he lived in the Eastern District. Um, you know, he he listed his home phone as his office phone, um, and and you know that was kind of the hook that uh, plaintiff used to establish venue in the Eastern District. Um, the, the challenge was made by Cray, the venue wasn't proper, and the district court um, said venue is proper and, and you know, gave some factors and said, you know, this is enough. Um, the fact that you have an employee working out of the Eastern District, um, that, that's sufficient here. And, and a big part of what the district court said was you don't need a physical presence of the corporation itself in the district to establish venue. That went up on mandamus to the Federal Circuit, and the Federal Circuit um, said venue was actually not proper. So what the Federal Circuit said was um, it, it, it kind of went through a very literal approach of this regular and established place of business uh, term and, and kind of gave a little bit of color on each part of it. Um, so for the regular aspect, they said the business has to be steady, it can't be sporadic, you know, a single act or a single transaction is not regular business. So, you know, if you're, if you're talking about, you know, kind of one-off sales, things like that, that's not going to cut it. Um, established, 
um, it gives th this idea of permanence, uh, uh, you know, transient is, is what they said, transient locations don't do it for venue, it has to be, you know, kind of a, a, a true permanent structure. And a big part of it, and this was the question I think a lot of folks had, is they said it had to be a physical presence. So you actually have to have some sort of physical entity in the district in order for venue to be proper there. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of folks have wondered, well, is you know web presence going to be enough for venue uh, after TC Heartland? And 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 the, the federal circuit came out and said, no, there actually has to be a physical uh, presence in the district. And, and another point that they emphasized is it has to be a physical presence of the defendant, not the defendant's employee. So you know, the facts in this case, they said, you know, just because you had an employee whose home was in the district, that doesn't cut it because that's not a physical presence of the of the defendant themselves. Um, you know, there was no record evidence that the employee was somehow compensated by the corporation for you know his home in the district or that his employment was contingent on him you know, maintaining his home in the district. Um, and that all factored into uh, the federal circuit's analysis uh, in saying that venue wasn't proper there. Um, I think this was, you know, an interesting decision and even, you know, even with the guidance that the Federal Circuit gave, I think it does still, you know, leave questions out there that I think we're, we're going to see get answered uh, soon. They're kind of bubbling up from the district courts now. I, I know one that, um, that, that we've seen is whether a server or you know a router in a district is enough to constitute a physical presence and the district courts have kind of come to different conclusions on that so that's a question I think we might see addressed uh, coming up um, so other than Cray there were a few other decisions uh, from the federal circuit that touched on you know venue and, and kind of the fallout from TC Heartland that I wanted to talk about um, the, the next one was this in Ray ZTE uh, case, which um, it, it addressed the issue of burden. So, uh, you know, plaintiff filed the suit, the defendant filed a motion and said, venue's not proper here. And the district court said, well, it's your motion, defendant, so you bear the burden of showing that, that venue is not proper. Um, that went up to the federal circuit, and the federal circuit disagreed. They said, once a venue dispute is actually, you know, raised by a defendant, the burden is on the, the patentee or the plaintiff to uh, show that venue is proper. Um, so this case was remanded for, for additional fact finding, um, just you know, kind of curious some of the things that uh, the Federal Circuit mentioned um, was at issue with a call center and the call center was staffed by someone other than the corporation and you know the Federal Circuit had questions that it wanted fact finding on and remand about you know, the extent to which the corporation controlled the call center operators, you know, whether the corporation owned or leased the facility that was in the district. So these are all kind of factors that the federal circuit seems to care about um, when thinking about this venue issue. Um, HTC was another case uh, that, that was interesting uh, from a venue perspective. Uh, so in HTC, you had a foreign uh, entity who was sued and the foreign entity tried to, you know, make a sort of venue argument that venue wasn't proper, where it was brought, where the case was brought. And the federal circuit said nothing about TC Heartland changes the general, you know, rule that for an alien uh, entity, any any district, any courthouse is is sufficient for venue. In other words, uh, there's no the, the venue federal venue statute doesn't apply to aliens. They 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 can be sued in any district. Um, the last case I wanted to talk about on venue, um, it, it's a little bit different than the uh, you know where one resides or regular place of business. Uh, it had to do with um, a venue case involving state of incorporation. So um, the company was sued in Texas uh, and. Uh, that was the state of incorporation, um, but the question was what judicial uh, district in Texas was proper? 
And you know, the argument was made on one side, well, if they're incorporated in Texas, any, any district in Texas is proper for venue. Um, federal Circuit said no to that. So what the Federal Circuit said is when you have a, a state with multiple uh, districts and the companies incorporated there, you have to look to where the company's principal place of business is in the state, and that district is where venue is proper. If the company doesn't have a, you know, a principal place of business and they're just using the state as a place of incorporation, then it's where the registered office is, the corporate filings are located. Um, so this all is just to say that when you're using state of incorporation, you, you don't get any district in the state. You have to actually look at either where the company's uh, operating out of or where their records are held. Um, and just to close out the venue topic, um, we, we put in this graph just to show the past year uh, where filings have been. And as you know, many people predicted, we're seeing a lot of filings in Delaware. You know, a lot of a lot of folks are using the state of incorporation to uh, to be the basis for venue. And of course, with you know so many corporations uh, incorporated in Delaware, we, we've just seen a lot of Delaware cases. Um, and, and less Eastern District of Texas cases than we've seen in years past. All right, thanks, Mike. So um, let's jump into some post grants on appeal, and uh, we'll start with the Supreme Court <clears throat> and oil states. So this is a case that um, I think all of us in the patent bar were looking at with great interest. Um, and uh, as I'm sure most of you know, it came out that IPR processes um, the IPR process does not abridge an Article III right, meaning they, they are constitutional and they can continue on. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things in the opinion from an administrative law perspective, but from, our, for our patent, from the patent perspective, it was just good to get an answer. Um, but to talk a little bit about the opinion, um, the majority focused on the idea that patents are public franchises, um, such that um, since the determination to grant a patent is outside the Article III context review, of that determination can be outside of the Article III context as well. Um, and there's a little notion of uh, you knew what you're getting into um, in that the court explained that you know patent claims are granted subject to the qualification that the PTO has the authority to re-examine them to potentially cancel a patent claim in an inter-parties review. Um, Justice Breyer's concurrence is interesting in that um, you know I think you wanted to make it very clear that the court's opinion should not be read to say that matters involving private rights may never be adjudicated um, other than by Article III courts. And this is sort of the Administrative Procedure Act law um, that is kind of fascinating for that, that segment of the bar. Um, and then, of course, the dissent um, kind of took a different view on whether what patents fundamentally are, um, considering them as private rights. And I think, you know, once you kind of make that call, um, at that point, it needs to be re um, reviewed by the Article III court. So that was oil states, greatly anticipated, um, but the key was to really just get an answer to the question. Um, SAS is somewhat similar in that, um, you know, if by way of background, the main issue on appeal in SAS was um, the PTO's practice of instituting on some claims that it was petitioned on, but not necessarily all of them. Um, and that was uh, uh, considered to be um, outside the um, statute. So um, the case went up to the, to the Supreme Court and the majority opinion um, decided that the statute itself, Section 318A, um, which says the PTO shall issue a final written decision with respect to the patentability of any patent claim challenged by the petitioner, was not ambiguous. And it meant you had to um, decide and issue a decision on every claim that was in the petition. Um, and so since the statute itself was not ambiguous, there was no need to give Chevron deference to the patent office. Um, you know, there were dissents. Um, you know, the first dissent by Justice Ginsburg thought the, the, the reading of the statute was a bit wooden um, and then would have applied the Chevron deference. Um, and uh, Justice uh, uh, Breyer, again, um, said that the, um, statute was ambiguous as to whether it was focused on the claims challenged in the petition, and it could equally mean that the claims were challenged in the uh, decision to institute. Um, and so, again, it was nice to get an answer on that. Um, since the opinion, um, the 
PTO has issued uh, its position that says it will institu institute um, not only on all claims, but also all grounds. And so the grounds weren't really this idea of like instituting on some grounds but not others was not squarely before the Supreme Court. Um, but uh, I think the, the PTO took the, the approach that it was going to treat them the same. And so now, um, if you get your uh, petition um, instituted into IPR, um, it will be on all claims and all grounds that you bring. So what are the takeaways? As I already alluded to, oil, oil states was a bit of nice to get the answer once you know the answer. Um, since they were constitutional, it really wasn't all that newsworthy because the you know, status quo continues on. Um, but again, for administrative law wonks, there are some interesting things in the opinions, and we may see the Supreme Court um, wade back into this issue of um, private rights, public rights, and how they can be adjudicated. Um, in SAS, again, I alluded to the PTO's guidelines, um, and what we saw in the wake of SAS is the PTO went back, um, uh, generally on, on motion of the petitioners, um, to do, you know, redo the institutions. And so if they had um, uh, institutions, uh, IPRs that were instituted on less than all the claims, um, you know, you had the opportunity to get them to reinstitute it. Um, we're now kind of in the midterm where the, the PTO is, um, is taking what we kind of would view as an honest cut, an honest cut at the request. It's obviously it's applying its guidelines. Um, it's uh, instituting on all claims and all uh, grounds, um, but you know we have seen that perhaps they telegraphed um, their their view on the weaknesses of some grounds or some claims, even if they go ahead and institute. Um, I think when we saw this opinion, you know people were debating, well, will we see um, the PTO choose not to institute, even if there's a really strong claim in the petition because it doesn't want to institute on all the claims? And so far, we really haven't seen that that be the case. That you're not really hurting a really strong claim by adding your other claims into the petition, um, but that is a risk. Um, and that's kind of what we allude to here, like long term, um, will the PTO attempt to be a bit more efficient and um, you're looking at the petition and saying, well, there's only one good claim here and 20 bad claims, we're not going to waste our resources on this particular um, petition, we're not going to institute IPR, but they may signify that um, uh, another petition with fewer claims or just a strong claim, you know, might get instituted. Um, so we'll have to see how this shakes out because obviously SAS requires the Patent Office um, to do a bit more work. So let's turn away from the Supreme Court and go back to the federal circuit um, on an en banc case, this aqua products case. Um, this case had to do with what happens when uh, during IPR the patent owner um, makes amendments to the claim. And it was looking at um, you know, who bore the burden as to uh, proving that those claims were patentable or not. Um, below, the PTO had actually put the burden on the patent owner to show that the amended claims were in fact patentable. Um, and this came up on to appeal and a very divided court um, indicated that um, that decision should be vacated, the court said that the patent office was wrong to put the burden on the patent owner. Um, the O'Malley opinion was kind of the one that got the most you know, consensus on this, and so that gives, that's where we derive our understanding. Um, she thought that the statute was um, unambiguous, um, but also felt like if there were no ambiguity, then the no regulations had been promulgated so that um, the PTO couldn't do what it did. Having said that, there were enough judges, there were five, Reina, Prost, Chen, Toronto, and Hughes, who found the statute was ambiguous. And the import of that would be that um, the PTO could issue regulations through rulemaking and then um, potentially change the standard uh, through that process. Um, and so we have a situation where we might see some you know, movement on this based on policy, um, but in the long run, you know, there's not a lot of amendments, and uh, the, the, the current state of the ruling we think will affect only your only the edge cases, um, because for now I think um, we are uh, working in a realm where um, the burden is not going to be placed on the patent owner. All right, so we do have a lot of IPR kind of appeals here, so we'll just run through a couple here on slide 15. Um, 
Wi-Fi One is interesting because they went on bonk to kind of um, change their mind and uh, overrule um, Acadie. Um, basically, that holding is that the Fed Circuit can now review the PTAB decisions on whether IPR petitions were filed within the one-year period they're allowed, whether they are time-barred. Um, and so uh, that was that was interesting um, to get an answer on that. Um, I think you know a lot of people felt like the old the old decision wasn't right. Click to call uh, is a case that went on bonk just in a very narrow area in footnote three, um, and it dealt with the situation where um, what is the event that triggers the one-year bar, right? So. Um, under Section um, 315B, you get a year from being served with a complaint in order to file your IPR petition. Um, in this particular case, the patent owner um, did file and serve a complaint, but later dismissed that complaint um, without prejudice. And so the idea was, um, well, does that count? Because, you know, in some contexts, when you um, dismiss a case without prejudice, it's as if the filing never happened. Um, but the court looked at this on bonk and said, well, the ordinary meaning, the plain meaning of service controls here, and service is service. It doesn't matter what happens later. And so um, since the statute was clear, there's no need to put Chevron deference or any other deference to the agency. And so now we all know that once you're served, the clock starts ticking. Um, you know, from a policy perspective, you know, people wonder, will patent owners try to game the system and, and, and file and serve just to get the IPR clock running um, and force the um, defendant to do their IPRs with maybe less than full information um, about what claims may be at issue, what's going on. Um, I, I tend to think that's probably an edge case um, because usually your, your goal to file a lawsuit is not to run out the clock on the IPR. You usually have other goals in mind. Um, so. Again, this is, an answer. this is a case that kind of clarifies the landscape. And quite frankly, um, having certainty, knowing what the rules are, just allows everyone to plan and advise their clients. And so it's better to have these decisions um, made and let the, let the rules be known. Um, there is actually um, an issue we've been using about in terms of in the future. So we also have a prohibition in the statute um, that says you can't file an IPR petition after you the defendant file a DJ action um, with respect to the patent. Um, so what happens um, when you file a DJ action and then you dismiss that um, without prejudice? Are you still barred? Um, the court hasn't ruled on that issue yet. Um, I think it's one that um, may be playing out a little bit, and so we can you know stay tuned to see if uh, these sort of machinations you know end up with some more clarity in the law. I'm um, having said that that is also not a super common situation where you are um, in a situation where you file a DJ action, then choose to withdraw it so you can file an IPR. I think most people um, who litigate in this field, you know, tend to have the clients mentally prepared for giving up their right to file IPR if they're going to bring the DJ lawsuit. Now, I know this is a moment that many of you have been waiting for, which is the uh, New York, New Jersey CLE code. That code is Please be sure to take it down and do what you need to do it to get your credit. So my last slide is more of a takeaway slide with respect to these IPR-based um, decisions um, on slide 16. And uh, the first thing kind of relates to, you know, the strategy behind what you do in crafting your IPR petitions in the wake of SAS. And so there was a thought um, in the past where you might not get instituted on all grounds or all claims where you might um, be able to get out of a stopple later if the PTO didn't institute on a ground that you brought. And so you might try to put extra grounds in your petition hoping that it, if it is not instituted, you are able to use that prior art um, later in litigation. Um, you know, I'm not sure that was you know, entirely clear that that was definitely going to be the case, but I think that was a strategy that people were employing when they were crafting their petitions. Um, of course, now um, the, the, it's going to be all claims and all grounds, in which case um, if you put a ground in, it's going to get instituted and it's going to be, um, it's going to be addressed and estoppel will attach. Um, also, we must keep in mind that estoppel does attach to, um, with respect to art you could have brought but did not. And so the practice tip here is 
you know, we really should be focusing on putting your best arguments in the petition um, and not being so focused on what's going to happen to you later with respect to estoppel based on the content of your petition. Um, I think that's the kind of the takeaway on um, in, in the wake of the SAS decision. Um, you know, other other tips we have here. Um, you know, make we make clear decisions about what you're going to you know, preserve in your in your case, um, and it's better to make those early so you're able to use your pages in the most um, effective manner. Um, there's a lot of issues of due process. Um, we see the court, um, you know, really looking at uh, people's due process rights, and so you want to be um, cognizant of what you need to uh, do to preserve those rights. Um, and then finally, this is, I think, one of the most important things that we've seen um, in the wake of these, um, you know, IPR post-grant decisions is, you know, keep in mind the place that your IPR strategy or your post-grant strategy plays in your overall dispute, your overall litigation. Um, we have cases um, that are multi-jurisdiction. You, know, multi you might see them in district court. You may see them in the ITC. You've got the appeal. They all fit together, and uh, I think you're you're really going to benefit your clients when um, you're looking at how these different venues um, interact with each other um, and the timing and the strategy around that. Um, and I think these decisions um, reinforce that that general strategy as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to John, uh, John Jackseth. He's going to talk a little bit about damages. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Um, fitting this all in in context, I've done, I'm looking at a, this book that I do a chapter for every year called the IP book, and I do a year in review, and it's the 16th edition of that. So I've done this 16 years in a row of going through, digging through cases, figuring out what are important. And what I learned from that is these things come in waves, right? At the, at the front end, we are doing presentations on the doctrine of equivalence and vitiation, case law, and whatever. I don't know the last time the court issued an important doctrine of equivalence case, right? That then maybe 10 to 15 years ago was all about claim construction. And that's still important just because claim construction is important to every case. And so it stays in there. Um, you know, and then uh, what Lauren just did, IPR post-grant, that's a wave that's still on its way up. Maybe it's crested, but it's certainly not on its way down. It's going to be a lead um, topic for years to come. But I think the, the other topics we have now are are some that may be crested in the in the last couple of years, maybe started five or ten years ago, and uh, they're still important, um, but they're 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 not lead candidates. So one is damages. So next slide. Um, the uh, case that matters uh, most to some people because it went to the Supreme Court is Western GECO. Um, I should note that Fish uh, represents a party in this case, and so I am not expressing opinions. You should not hear me expressing opinions. I'm trying to be as factual as I can here um, because I think that's the appropriate thing to do. But the case is about um, these sonar uh, arrays that you can pull behind a boat. And I think they use it to find if there's oil in the, in the ground underneath the water. But the invention generally relates to these being kind of smart and, steer and individually steerable, right? So think about putting like a uh, Wi-Fi in every single one of these and a rudder in every single one of these and then be able to coordinate what they do. And so you can turn them around faster, supposedly, and things like that. If they can all kind of steer in coordination and they don't get tangled as much and so on. The issue was that these the defendant made them in the U.S. and then sold them overseas, uh, literally overseas, I guess, or into the seas um, and even into international waters where people would tow them around. And the biggest portion of the damages was supposed lost profits that the patentee had for not being able to tow its arrays around. Um, and so the question was whether those lost profits for the overseas use of these uh, devices were blocked or not under 271F. If you remember, 271F is basically you export the components or at least the important components of an invention and then they get assembled and so they don't infringe until they're overseas, but the steps are taken in the U.S. that lead to that overseas, um, let's call it overseas practicing of the patent. I don't know if you call it infringement, but at least overseas practicing of the patent. And the question was whether the patentee just gets a royalty for the manufacturing that occurred in the U.S. 
or can get um, a lost profits for what occurred overseas. Federal Circuit said only the U.S. side, not lost profits for the overseas. They relied on some 271A case law that had a presumption against uh, extrajudicial or extraterritorial application, and they extended that to 271F. The uh, petitioner went at the Supreme Court said we should have a different rule for 271F. Um, that, that that's wrong. Then the solicitor came in and had a broader view of how this law should be and had a view that 271A law really should be changed. Like the whole area of law on damages related to infringement should be changed. 271A is just regular infringement, right? 99% of the patent cases are 271A infringement cases. Um, and so the solicitor came in with a bigger view even than the petitioner. Supreme Court wrote their opinion, Justice Thomas, to really say, listen, we're only deciding the 271F case issue today, and they've decided it broader. But that leaves these issues for the future that some of the amici have had raised in the case. So one is, how does this 271F ruling and the reasoning that led to the ruling affect 271A damages? And so if you are a company or you are suing someone that does certain stuff in the US and certain stuff overseas, you should uh, read, read up on the issues related to Western Chico. For example, if, um, and, and you know, this is common, Southeast Asian manufacturing and maybe uh, sales or engineering or other activity occurring in the US, or maybe there's some manufacturing occurring in the US and some overseas and the assembly is overseas, uh, can you get damages or how much damages can you get if some of that activity is overseas, but the, the infringing items never come back into the U.S. Um, what, you, know, you might have a sale or an offer for sale in the U.S., but the make, use, and sell is outside the U.S. How does this affect those damages? Still an open issue in a lot of areas. And then also, could this uh, decision affect where companies establish their businesses? And if you have a business, should you take it into consideration and where you, have, where you put it, whether you put it in the U.S. or whether you put it overseas? Uh, next slide. I think that there aren't that many other big damages cases. To me, uh, the big one is Xmark, but I'll start with Finjin. Finjin just said that apportionment of damages applies for reasonable royalties just as it does for lost profits. When that case came out, I, I, I thought they'd already said that. So to me, that wasn't that big of a case. Um, but y y you know, if you were in the middle of a litigation, obviously, if that involved the issue, it would be big to you. I think the bigger case, the, you know, if I was going to read one damages decision this year, it'd be X mark. Um, and that came out two days later. It kind of repeated the rule from Finjin that apportionment is required uh, for reasonable royalty, not just lost profit. But then it said some very, I think, important things about apportionment between the base versus apportionment in the rate of the royalty. And they, they said, you can basically apportion in one place or the other, but the expert has to explain themselves for why they did what they did and how they got to the number that they did, right? And so it's important. X marks is actually the fact of X mark are a pretty good example of, of where this matters. You look at this lawnmower, it's an X mark mower. I don't know if it has any invention in it because the invention is a little curved piece of steel under the mower deck. That's it. It's probably like a nickel. In, in cost and maybe $2 in labor to weld it in there. But because of the shape of the little piece of steel, apparently the grass comes out better and doesn't clump and what have you, okay? So if, if you're talking a royalty on that $2 piece of steel with a couple dollars worth of labor into it, you're not gonna get much in damages. If you're talking about a royalty on a $12,000 lawnmower, you're gonna get a lot more in damages. Um, and so it makes a big deal, the difference. And, but, and, and, you know, the trick is, what should the answer be? And I think the court, uh, Judge Stoll wrote the opinion in this case, did a really good job of uh, maybe applying a, a, a common law approach to law without announcing a loud rule, but still kind of making a rule uh, that can be flexibly applied in the future. Her problem was, you know, to avoid that big damages total for a cheap piece of steel that might not be a big invention, she's facing this idea that you, you don't just focus on the point of novelty of the invention, right? That the, that the piece of steel is the point of novelty. And here the claim covered the entire mower. 
you know, they recited a mower with an engine and a mower deck and a couple of wheels and all that stuff. Um, and she couldn't say, well, we're just going to look at the point of novelty, which is the curved piece of metal. She did a good job. She said, really, she cited some case on said, well, you have to look at the inventions, quote, footprint in the marketplace, all right, which is, I think, just a much cleverer way of saying the point of novelty. But it was, what does the benefit of having less clumping and all of that, what does that do to the value of the defendant's lawnmower in the marketplace, right? And she said, listen, you can apply a royalty to $12,000. You can apply a bigger royalty to, let's say, $5 for the strip of steel, but you have to just explain yourself. And in this case, they sent it back because the expert for uh, the patentee had not explained why she picked a 5% royalty. Um, I have a question. Let me go back to Western GECO. It says, how is the Western GECO case different from ProMega versus Life Technologies? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think ProMega and Life, I think ProMega Life had to do with whether you had to export more than one component or, or whether a export of a single component would do. I don't think that was an issue in Western GECO. So really ProMega in my mind was more, was there a 271 or I'm sorry, yeah, 271F infringement, whereas Western GECO was more, how does the, what, section 284 damages, how do those apply to a 271F infringement? So one was more a damages case and the other was more an infringement case. Um, okay, back to this slide. Marking, there's Articat versus Bombardier. Uh, small, I don't think this is going to be a big, decision and for most people it has to do with what happens when your licensees don't mark or who has the burden to prove that the licensees of the patentee didn't mark and they said it's the defendant that has the initial burden of going, coming forward and then the, the patentee has to come back uh, and actually prove it in the end uh, next slide please so takeaways on damages i think the big thing is is from x mark right we i was at least told people try to get claims on big systems so that you can have a higher royalty base right? Claim the whole car, claim the whole lawnmower, what have you. And I think that's still good advice um, where you can do that um, because it does allow you to take the bigger royalty or it more readily allows you to take the, the bigger royalty base. You, you're still, you're going to have to lower your percentage quite a bit, but that, I think it's a whole lot better to try and go with a $12,000 royalty base and lower your percentage than it is to be stuck with a $5 royalty base and try to jack up your percentage. You know, you can't go, you know, here at five bucks uh, and then you're asking for over 100 percent royalty base because that five dollar piece of steel is worth so much. That's a lot harder uh, position to take than to say, hey, all we want is half a percent of twelve thousand um, bucks. So I think that's still there. There's other benefits to claiming the whole system, right? It, it allows the, the examiner to see your invention in context. It also makes the examiner come up perhaps with more references to come up with all the limitations. But there are not easy claiming tricks. You still have to basically tie the value of your invention to your damages theory at the end of the day. All right, next slide. Now we're on to uh, another presenter. Thank you much. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, standard essential patents. Um, there's really just one case I wanted to touch on here. Um, I, I think it's a, a really interesting case. Um, it, it's it's somewhat factual, you know, kind of fact heavy, um, but I do think it, it kind of signals um, where the federal circuit's thinking is about these standard essential patents and whether, you know, they're going to be willing to say that, you know, patents are, are unenforceable because of a, a breach of someone's um, duty to the standard setting organization. So um, core wireless is the case I'm hinting at. Uh, the, the, what happened here uh, is Back in the late 90s, uh, there were proposals uh, to Etsy for um, things having to do with the GPRS standard. That, that is a standard relating to 2G and 3G communications. Um, and one of the proposals was submitted by Nokia, who was the original assignee of the patent that was at issue in the core wireless case. So Nokia you know, made its proposal to the standard setting uh, body um, and a couple things. It, its proposal, when it made it, um, there was no issued patent on that proposal. What they had was just an application. So they had a patent application on it, but it hadn't actually issued into a patent yet. 
Um, the other interesting fact is their proposal wasn't actually adopted. So what they, you know, their proposal had to do with synchronization of timing information. And they said, you know, our, we propose to do it this way all the time. The proposal that ended up getting adopted was, we'll do it that way sometimes, but it doesn't have to be all the time. So, um, you know, ultimately what, what Etsy put forward wasn't their exact proposal. Um, so we've got a patent application and the proposal wasn't adopted. What's interesting is the federal circuit came out and said, even though your proposal wasn't ultimately adopted and even though you didn't have an issued patent, you only had an application, you were still obligated to uh, disclose that to the standard setting organization um, as soon as you made the proposal and to let them know that you had an application pending on this. Um, so the only expert that provided testimony um, about this point was a former uh, Etsy board member. And so he, you know, testified that, yeah, you know, Etsy would consider a patent application as an IP right that you have to disclose when you put forward a proposal. And he also testified that, you know, your obligation triggers when you actually make the proposal. doesn't matter if the proposal is actually adopted. Um, so, uh, you know, I think those are what, those facts are what make this an interesting case that at least for Etsy, you know, other standard setting organizations might have different policies, but at least for Etsy, um, you know, an application and was enough and the proposal didn't end up having to be adopted in order to, to find the patent unenforceable. Um, next slide, please. Uh, oh, and actually one thing I did want to mention is that the disposition of the case is it was actually remanded back down to the district court to uh, for the district court to determine whether um, there was any benefit that um, that Nokia got from its proposal since the proposal wasn't actually adopted you know the question was well was there a benefit because you know this is an equitable defense so there are, you know to find the patent unenforceable Nokia would have had to have gotten a benefit from uh, you know its its the proposal that it made. Um, so, I mean, I think the takeaways are, are, are pretty clear here. You know, um, companies should be very um, diligent when they make a proposal to put forward not just issued patents, but applications if the standard setting organization uh, requires that. Um, you know, and I, 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 like I said at the beginning, I, I think you could view this case as, as limited to, you know, kind of very specific facts. But again, I, I think it, it could be a harbinger of things to come. And, and it does show the Federal Circuit's um, willingness to, to find these patents unenforceable when, uh, you know, an organization doesn't live up to its uh, duties to the, to the standard setting organization. Um, and I think that brings us back to Lauren for the next topic. Thanks, Mike. All right, so let's jump into section 101. Um, always a fun topic to talk about at these yearly reviews. I think what we saw in the in um, this year in the 101 context that was rather interesting was issues that actually were decided not to take on bonk. And so we'll start with this um, Berkheimer case where um, you know basically there was a motion to dismiss um, and uh, the the patent owner decided to put in an amended complaint. Um, and uh, ultimately, this amended complaint had a lot of information um, alleging different facts about um, how unconventional um, the technology was in the, in the claims. Um, and uh, the court um, ruled that summary judgment or Rule 12 disposition um, was not appropriate. Um, because the patent itself indicated that the invention was not well understood, routine, and conventional. Um, and so, you know, why, why is this kind of noteworthy? And it's really the head, the head bullet point, which is, you know, something I think we all knew that Section 101, although it's a question of law, does have underlying facts. And these particular facts have to do with whether or not the invention um, was well understood, routine, or conventional. Um, and that is uh, an issue that needed to be treated like any other factual issue in terms of summary judgment or Rule 12, and that you could raise genuine issue material facts on that particular issue to defeat um, uh, summary determination, um, early adjudication of this issue. Um, they also, this case, gave us some guidance 
about you know what is conventional. Um, and again, I think in some ways it was not a surprise, but it's certainly useful to have this information um, codified in a case that um, simply because uh, technology is disclosed in prior art is not the same as it being conventional. So con the concept of conventionality is much more narrow than what you would consider in um, section 102. Um, we also have on this slide here um, an Atrix software case. Um, this was where, again, um, like it's more specifically, this case was uh, the, the fellow circuit um, vacated the denial of a motion to amend because the motion to amend was going to add a lot of facts, um, at least factual allegations, and send it back to the court. Um, and ultimately, the court, um, as I said, uh, declined to take on bonk review of either of these issues about whether um, you know, how to treat the review of decisions of finding a fact. Um, and uh, overall, you can see, you know, this is common law at its best with different judges advancing their, their views and you know, trying to come to consensus as we, as we see the case law develop. Um, so what do you take away from Berkheimer? I mean, we're seeing a lot of cases where the patentees um, on the front end are loading up their complaints with assertions about unconventionality. Um, obviously, they still can't be conclusory because these conclusory statements are not going to be enough. Um, this raises the question, especially in light of Berkheimer itself, to the patent drafters when you're drafting your specification, you know, be talking about how unconventional the technology is or how you're using known, te known components in an unconventional way. Um, you know, we see that um, like if patentees assertions that something is unconventional, um, will that be admissible as a fact, you know, even though it's kind of self-serving? Um, I think we can feel rather comfortable that admissions against interest about conventionality would be kind of considered a fact that could, you know, the court could take notice of. Um, and then we're going to see the same sort of um, issues with experts when the, when the courts can reject statements by experts. Um, about conventionality or unconventionality, if they're too conclusory. I tend to think that the, you know, this sort of uh, line is already being drawn in the summary judgment context, and courts will be well equipped to handle it. Um, but these are issues we will um, you know, probably see some movement on in the near future. Um, the last point we wanted to add here is um, if you are a patentee and uh, you are um, either loading up your complaint in the first instance or looking to amend your complaint. Um, you know, is this a situation where um, you may just be just, you know, delaying the day of reckoning? You know, you know maybe there'll be a question of fact. Um, maybe there'll be some claim construction that has to be done. Um, and, uh, but in the end of the day, are you really just putting your client um, through unnecessary costs? Um, you know, and certainly I, I understand that, you know, Clients have patents and they're presumed valid, and but I think it's always good advice to take a real hard look at your patents before you decide to embark on litigation that, that could be costly, especially in, in the wake of these one-on-one decisions. Next slide. Um, this is uh, this is somewhat interesting, at least to us, um, that you know we understand the patent office will be issuing some new guidelines with respect to the examining core on when to um, issue. Um, patents in, in the wake of these 101 cases and the 101 um, precedent that's been developing. So Director Yanku uh, made some statements, um, I guess, last month, um, and you know, we've got a lot, a lot of bullet points here um, that kind of go through, um, you know, what he was thinking, um, you know, that gives us maybe some insight as what the guidelines might say. Um, but ultimately, I think that the sense is there's a suggestion that we might see um, the Patent Office um, you know, continue to be granting patents or maybe shifting away from these uh, denying patents um, based on 101. Now, I don't think it's going to be um, a stark contrast. It might just be a subtle shift. Um, and uh, the practice tip here is, you know, when you're in this area prosecuting patents that have potential 101 issues, you want to ask yourself, how can I serve my client best? What will be in my client's best interest in the long run? And whether, you know, if the standard, you know, the pendulum swings back a little bit, so it's a little bit easier to get one-on-one -on -one patents out of the office, um, you got to ask yourself, um, are they going to still stand up in court? 
And so if you have a client whose business and whose practice, whose intent is to litigate their patents and enforce them and monetize them through litigation efforts if needed, you may want to um, you may want to continue to hold your claims to a higher standard so that you know they'll they'll stand up, they'll have a better chance of standing up if challenged in litigation. Uh, on the other side, if your if your client's some business model is to um, obtain patents and very rarely assert them, but use them as part of maybe defensive portfolio negotiations or in portfolio um, you know licensing efforts without necessarily you know resorting to litigation. Then you know maybe maybe the maybe the numbers game helps you and a lower standard allows you to get more patents. Um, but the idea is to go in really as you would um, I think in any prosecution, but particularly here, go in really cognizant of what your client's um, ultimate goals are going to be for the life of these patents. So I'm going to um, we're going to switch to obviousness, the next topic, and uh, I'll turn it over to John Dragseth to um, talk about that. All right, thank you. So I've got uh, a few cases here on obviousness and then kind of a bigger picture thing to talk about. Um, the, not, nothing huge in any uh, of these cases. Um, the process, I think this one's somewhat important. There was some debate about, you know, do you do your objective indicia, your secondary considerations after you've made some other conclusion of obviousness? Can you do them all together? Do you have to do them all together? That sort of thing. I think in intercontinental great brands, the court generally said there's not a requirement about how you do them. Um, you know, they've said you have to take into account secondary indicia and so on, but that there can be a motivation to combine and then a consider, or I guess a determination of whether there's a motivation to combine and then a determination of the secondary indicia or the ind objective indicia or whatever you want to call. I guess I've merged them into secondary indicia here. But there's not a, a, a formal process that you have to follow in, in dealing with the various factors. And gosh darn, I didn't co correct the error here. The Lemley pending cert petition that I needed to add into here. Um, and I've forgotten the name of the case, but the next point is this issue of fact and law, right? The object or uh, obviousness is a mixed question of fact and law. And there's a lot of uh, hand wringing about where does the law or where does the fact hand off to the law? Um, and so, we don't have a great answer to that. I think that for cer certain people, like the cert petition in Apple versus Samsung and this Lemley pending cert petition, um, there is a concern that the federal circuit is giving too much deference on the fact issues, okay? That there's too much fact and not enough law in obviousness. Um, you know, I think in Apple versus Samsung that, that the court went through and said, listen, um, we're gonna take the, you know, any reasonable, conclusion the jury could have made on the scope of the prior art, any reasonable conclusion the jury could have made in Apple's favor on the difference between the prior art and the and so on, and any reasonable conclusion the jury could have made in favor of the secondary considerations. And then when we look at those, the jury could have found obviousness. And I think the, the cert petition there was saying, well, no, the federal circuit needs to step in as a court and apply a little more of the legal side in balancing those factors or what have you. And that issue keeps coming up. So I think uh, just keep your eye on it. Don't assume that it's set forever um, and keep it in mind. And then there's inherency and obviousness, right? And so um, kind of the big issue there is when you have inherent an inherent feature, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, known to people in the art for anticipation, okay? So if the feature was there in a product that was operating inherently, uh, you don't have to show that anybody even knew it was there because it was just, it was present in the world. But the answer is different for obviousness because here you, you're asking really what did the person of ordinary skill in the art know and what would they, um, you know, why would they combine or why would they do certain things or why would they make certain modifications? And if they didn't know about the feature, they couldn't have made uh, uh, that, that modification that you're asking them to make. So there's inherency plays a different role in obviousness than it does in anticipation. Then on top of this, you have some, um, uh, some question in the anticipation realm about uh, some law, I forget the original case, but the, the court has said it a few times in a case called Blue Calypso was the second time they said it, um, where they said, well, you can have anticipation and inherency 
where the skilled artisan would readily envisage the feature that's not explicitly disclosed, right? So what does that mean, right? If would readily envision means, oh, well, when the skilled artisan reads about the, the express feature, he would understand that express feature to include this unstated feature. That's okay. But if what you mean by would readily envisage, envisage is he would read the express feature and then the implicit feature is just so obvious it would pop into his mind. Well, that's not really anticipation anymore, okay? So they've got this, this edge between inherency for anticipation and then the world of obviousness and there's some bleeding between them and they're having a, a bit of a problem drawing where that line ought to be and how the bleeding should stop and so on. And I think you'll see something in the future. Um, so uh, there is a question, I'm not sure where this fits in. It says, any indication that Williamson decision standard about means plus function trigger will be revisited to provide clarity? Okay, um, so that's a question on a, a claim construction. If you remember Microsoft Williamson, or maybe it was one of Microsoft customers that was on the other side of the V in that case, but uh, we did the, the case about the presumption related to means plus function in, in claim construction. I doubt they're going to revisit that Williamson issue, although I, there is a lot of stuff they could do in the means plus function area about um, you know, about when is structure adequately recited in a claim, when is structure adequately recited in a specification, and what happens in those areas. So I don't think you're going to get a whole lot of clarification on, on the core Williamson issue. I don't know if you're even going to get clarification on means plus function in the near future because it's really confusing, and I don't think there's a judge on the court that has a really strong view and, and confidence in what it ought to be. So. Um, as far as means plus function claim construction, we're not going to get much in the future. Uh, next slide, please. John, so, well, actually, hold on. Before you go on, um, let me maybe ask. You know, there's another question pending. Sorry to interrupt you about the 101. I thought maybe I would answer it. Um, and the question is, did you ever see a 101 factual dispute? Would you could you ever see a 101 factual dispute going to a jury, um, like some indefinite challenges have? Um, and I think that's a real possibility. So it's not a long answer, but um, I think if, uh, if you can have summary judgment motions denied because of the general issue material effect there, um, I, I, I can see it going to the jury. Whether you would have a right to go to the jury, I think is something that might require a little bit more analysis, but I suspect most district court judges would send it to the jury for at least advisory opinion. Yeah. So let me give you a flip side just real quick on that is willfulness it, post halo. What goes to a jury in that, you know, I think that people may have an assumption that 101 stuff doesn't go to a jury. Um, maybe people don't have that assumption, but if you did a poll, I would guess that more people would say that 101 should be done by a judge than would say by a jury. But if you went to willfulness and enhancement and so on, I think 99% of people would say, well, a jury should decide willfulness and should decide most of the issues for enhancement, and then the judge should come in and do some sort of equitable thing. But that's another issue that I don't think is resolved there. So we do have some jury trial right issues, a couple of them floating around out there in patent law that haven't been resolved yet. Um, back to obviousness really quick. The takeaways to me is obviousness is the most important issue in patent law right now in my mind because of post-grant, right? 103 is an issue in every gosh darn post-grant case basically. And I don't think we've come close to doing enough thinking about it. And so, you know, things like when does the level of skill in the art matter? Um, a lot of the issues that I, and, and reasons why I don't think we've done enough thinking about it is IPRs, I think, in my mind, are done too often by people who have seen too many office actions, okay? And office actions do a poor job of performing a real obviousness analysis, right? You look at an office action, it's, well, here's reference A teaches uh, limitations A, B, and C, reference B, teaches uh, limitations D and E, and it would have been obvious to, to put them together because it would have made your computer run faster. To me, that's an invalid obviousness combination because all that's really saying is you would have combined them to make the system better. The big thing that people often miss is to say, well, yeah, it would have made the system better and a skilled artisan would have recognized ahead of time that it would have made the system better or how it would have made the system better or why it would have made the system better. A lot of petitions in IPR forget that part. And so they're effectively a hindsight analysis on motivation to combine. Um, so, 
you know, there's that. There's other, other things about, you know, what do you do when a lot of the prior art kind of teaches away but doesn't? The law tells us to look at all the prior art, not just the one uh, reference that might have a motivation and then ignore all other references unless they have a teaching away. I don't think we've done enough thinking in that area. I don't think we've done enough thinking about what it means for the result to be predictable or uh, whatever the other terminology they use versus the art being predictable in, in, in the uh, obviousness area. And I think there's a lot of sloppiness in bringing in secondary considerations of non-obviousness. People just give up on it because the PTO rejects those all the time. But I think the PTO rejects those all the time because people do a poor job of putting it together. Um, so I think that it's worth some thought on your side if you're involved in a lot of IPRs and a lot of litigation to back up and say, you know, what are we really getting at with 103 and obviousness? And where are the edges of this law? And what can we do to chip away with at them. You know, we certainly do on our side in our group and we're, you know, that's how Williams, Williamson came about, for example, is that was an area that we recognized as a weak area in the law and we pushed it and got a case up and got it taken in bank and, and fixed the law in a way that was good for us and for our clients. Um, and so you should be trying to do uh, similar things. Um, otherwise, we, we have uh, immunity as, as a couple of slides on that. Basically, the Federal Circuit said there is not tribal immunity. Um, and then there's a University of Minnesota case that's just been briefed and will probably be argued sometime in the spring about whether there's state immunity from an IPR. Um, I think it's hold on and see what happens in those cases. Um, In-bank briefing is going on in, in the tribal immunity case. And so there may be a change there and maybe the Supreme Court will change. So nothing, you know, it's probably for most of you, uh, keep, keep your, uh, you know, ear to the radio on immunity, but otherwise not, not anything going on for a few months. And then, uh, All right. finally, oh, go ahead. We, we have some. No, I was going to say we're, we're, friends, we're running at the end of our, our session, but um, we do always like to talk about what's coming up. And so John, why don't you give us a little briefing on that? Yeah, I'll just, I, I won't hit all of these, but there's Helsin, which I don't think is that important of a case that's at the Supreme Court. It's what sort of activity, you know, secret sales activity triggers a 102B bar. It's only relevant to you if you or your competitor went and had a sale and then waited a year to file your patent application um, and, and had a sale that was kind of public and kind of private. Um, so I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal in the patent law, but uh, I could be wrong. And then we have all these kind of constitutional IPR uh, and other constitutional cases. And here's where I get to use my quote from Omar Little of The Wire. And if you, have, if you don't know Omar Little, he's one of the greatest characters ever. And his quote is, if you go for the king, you best not miss. Um, right? So the, the, the bigger the shot you're taking, the better your shot better be. And that's my view on these constitutional issues. If you think you're going to wipe out the ability of the federal circuit to do a rule of 36 affirmance, a summary affirmance, if you think you're going to wipe out every PTAB proceeding that's ever been done because the appointments clause uh, uh, was violated, um, if you think you're going to wipe out IPRs totally for pre-AIA patents, even though oil states didn't do it for all patents, you better have about a 99.9% .9 argument because you're trying to unsettle billions of dollars of settled expectations. And you know, regardless of what a law professor or a law student might tell you about a legal issue, the courts are practical. And so um, I'm, I'm skeptical on all of these issues. Maybe the appointments one, I think, has the best odds. But uh, keep your eye on them because people keep bringing them to the Supreme Court. OK, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. We'll post an on-demand replay within about 48 hours um, at fr.com. If you have any questions regarding the CLE credit, please email Fish's MCLE team at the email address on the screen, which I'm not sure it still is. But um, And you, of course, can always visit fr.com for more information or contact any of us. Um, we'd be happy to um, answer your questions or put you in touch with the right CLE people. Thanks again.